Welcome to another edition of Right Voices. I'm John Hart, the co-founder of C3 Solutions and the editor of our news magazine, C3. Today, we're honored to be joined by U.S. Representative Brett Guthrie, who's represented Kentucky's second congressional district since 2009. He serves on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and he's a member of the Conservative Climate Caucus. Congressman, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me here. I really appreciate it. But so tell us a little bit just to introduce yourself and describe, you know, something about, you know, Kentucky's second district and why you decided to run for Congress. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. So Kentucky's second district is home of birthplace of Abraham Lincoln. I know Illinois claims him, but he was born on, on Sinking Creek in LaRue County. He would say Hardin County when he wrote his uh, biography, campaign biography. I think he wrote an autobiography. He didn't have the opportunity to. But that's in my district, Fort Knox, the gold. I've seen it. It's there. And uh, my favorite treasure in my district are the men and women who serve our country in uniform at Fort Knox. So mm -hmm. it's um, Mammoth Cave National Park. So those are our, our national kind of treasures here. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderful people and a beautiful place. I'm from Bowling Green, home of the Corvette. So oh, as wow. we're speaking, uh, there's the Corvette drive-in. So the whole town is full of people who own Corvettes driving around town right now. So it's a, it's a wonderful place. So what drove me, it, it sounds... Uh, I don't want to sound hokey or anything as such as that, but I came of age during Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. I was in high school in the 1980s and talk about mourning in America and hope and freedom. And my grandparents, both all four of my grandparents were extremely patriotic, but my, my dad's oldest brother was killed in the Korean war. Oh. And so uh, that just kind of lingers over family. When I see these families that lost mm -hmm. uh, children in the Afghan and Iraq war, I know it's going to linger over their family forever. As long as everybody's alive, who remembers them will, will be that way. And so it was just very patriotic. It was like, I don't want my son to have died in vain. And so my grandmother always took us to cemeteries mm -hmm. on Memorial Day to his, his gravesite on Memorial Day. And so when Ronald Reagan came along, it was like morning in America, let's uh, fight the Russians. And I was inspired. I, I went to West Point and I, was, I literally was uh, admitted to West Point of the month of, of his uh, evil empire speech. Oh, wow. And decided to get out of the army because of the fall of the Berlin Wall and was going to do a career. And my father had started a business in the meantime. And so when it looked like anything but my colleagues who did careers really sacrificed. But it, it, it appeared in 1990 that the army was going to be boring for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, you remember books written the end of history? Oh, yeah. <laughs> about the, and, and so what did was that? A mistake, but I didn't know that. Yeah, they had a different idea. Yeah. So when I got out of the army, I was going to work in business, but I hoped there was an opportunity to serve again and had the chance to serve in the state Senate. And then uh, Senator McConnell called me when my predecessor decided to retire and encouraged me. And I said, you know, this really gets back to dealing with the deficit, dealing with international problems, dealing with uh, major issues, the military. Maybe uh, there's no way whatsoever to compare to our men and women who are in uniform, but I certainly hope that I can give some kind of service as well. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. So I want to put a footnote, a, a marker on the Reagan era, because I want to circle back to that in a minute. But okay. one, you also made a decision to join a caucus called the Conservative Climate Caucus, which now has, you know, more than 80 members. And, we you know, we live in this time when people on the left tend to say, like, we're the ones that care about the environment. We care about climate change. And a lot of people don't understand that there are millions and millions and millions of very conservative voters that care deeply about environmental stewardship. Can you talk about why, how you view that issue and why you decided to join that caucus? Yeah, I, I care deeply about environmental stewardship. I'm a National Parks fan, Mammoth Caves in, in my district. So we I care about um, stewardship. And, and the thing is, we don't need to cede this space to the liberals because they're wrong on climate change in a lot of ways. I call them climate exaggerators. So when you sit back and, and if, if you could convince people like Al Gore tried to do that 75 percent chance we would have no polar ice caps today, which is not true. We have more polar bears than we had 20 years ago uh, because we quit hunting them, except for certain groups of people that hunted them in, in their, you know, throughout history of their of their of their native land. And, and so you look at, you know, Greta Thornburg tweeting that if we don't quit, if, if we don't do, go to zero carbon in five years, the earth's going to be uninhabitable. You, you have that kind of seep in as a Harvard scientist said by 22, 2022, it's almost certain there would be no polar ice caps. That's just not, that's just climate exaggeration, but it has a penetration. So I'm on a NATO committee, spent mm -hmm. a lot of time dealing with our European NATO member, par, members of parliament. And I've seen how 
allowing the misrepresentation of what's going on in climate change has hurt Europe. I mean, essentially has Europe's at war because of some decisions, I think the Biden administration made, what they made in Europe, which has funded, it's led to the ability for Putin to do what he's done because of yeah. energy policy funds his army. And and so, yeah. I mean, their decisions didn't say go to Kiev, but their decisions allowed him to have the money to go to Kiev. Well, and, well, and it's really hurt yeah, their economy. And so when I was talking with a future Senator, John Curtis, and he was starting the Climate mm -hmm. Caucus, Conservative Climate Caucus, he said, I think what we need to all agree on that less carbon is better. Less carbon is a better effort. So let's, how do we have a position on climate stewardship? The climate is changing. The question is how much is man affecting it? I mean, that's still, I think, debated, but we can we can put less carbon in the atmosphere. And I think that's the right way to, to go. And that's why I joined the Conservatives. If we're not going to solve this by asking people to go backwards. And that's what the left does. And they want you know, energy policies that have intermittent energy, energy that's too expensive. And and we don't want that. We're going to solve it by moving forward. And that's why I'm, I'm on the Conservative Cli Climate Caucus to put forth those policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you mentioned so the, the Reagan era. So mm -hmm. I, I had the I had the benefit of of working for a guy named Walt Raymond, who was a, a national security advisor for Reagan. Uh, I did a democracy building project in post-war Yugoslavia, and and Walt uh, wrote a lot of the national security memos on environmental strategy, mm -hmm. and what he wrote was essentially similar to what you just described and John Curtis talked about, that we have an opportunity in the West to talk about the superior innovation and cleanliness of American enterprise and contrast that with mm -hmm. the totalitarian systems of the Soviet world, and, and that's an opportunity to win hearts and minds to the next generation, so he was he was absolutely right. Other groups in our in our ecosystem, like ACC, are doing doing that as well. Exactly. Well, we have a, a great we have a great example of that. When I was a kid, getting Weekly Reader and all the other things, it was population growth in the population country control. and, and population control. I was in grad school in the 1990s. Warren Buffett was there, and somebody asked him, "What's your biggest uh, policy?" This is in the 1990s. Population control. If you look back at at, at the non market solutions, China one child policy. Even Robert McNamara, of all the bad decisions he made, one that he was never allowed to make, but he debated as head of the World Bank, well, maybe we shouldn't invest in healthcare in Africa because people are just going to starve to death. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's crazy the solutions that people make when they have these catastrophic end of the world views. But if you look at population, so this is why I say admit carbon in the atmosphere. Their argument was we're going to go from 3 billion to 7 billion people by 2020. We actually went from 3 billion to 8 billion. Mm -hmm. So they were right, except they were wrong in terms of the free market. What happened? We have excess food. The problem isn't having enough food. The problem is getting the food to where people need it. And usually that's where totalitarian government is, is where people have food issues. And so that, that's, that's kind of my base on this is that, okay, we can accept there's a problem, an issue that needs to be addressed. And we can show you every solution that that the left tried to put forth for population control was actually negative towards that. And whereas the free market and the productivity, we have less people growing food and more food than we've ever had because of technology and innovation. A lot yeah. of it's energy. Exactly. Well, well, actually, the, the the specific one of the specific reasons we've had such an explosion in food efficiency and growth, and I'm 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 li I live on a farm. I've got. 62 acres is is a breakthrough in what you know very well and what's coming is fertilizer yes. and that fertilizer derives from fossil fuel and natural gas mm -hmm. and so in many ways that 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 really enabled us to avoid what the left viewed as this catastrophic uh, result well the way i kind of view it is is as you look at it and and you have the people on the left and they always think they're the smartest people in the room and they can't and i don't think they can like when you say wind and solar and that, i don't think they can accept that they can't figure out the solution. And so whatever they think is the solution is what they put forth. If you were sitting in the room in the 1970s, how are we going to fix population control? Well, somebody's going to come up with a solution that fixes it, but it's not anybody in this room. I don't think they could accept it. It's like, you know, flight in the late 1890s, early 1900s, Smithsonian was given a prize to come up with a way to fly. You know, two brothers in Dayton, Ohio, were sitting on the back porch watching birds fly and go, well, maybe it's not power, maybe it's lift. And when they figured out it was lift and that led to fly. And so, and they weren't, you know, the renowned scientists that the Smithsonian were hiring 
They were it two wasn't brothers. a big step for the They're two brothers who had mechanical ability to say, I'm going to take that thought and put it in place. And and that's what's going to happen with climate change. I absolutely believe, it, believe that. There's going to be technology. The problem you get to with the left is that they it's anti-fossil fuels. So mm -hmm. let's say you could dig coal and have carbon sequestration, have no carbon going to the air. They still oppose that. They try to mandate EVs without plugged-in hybrids. Well, plug-in hybrids means you could drive around. People would buy those because the biggest worry with EV is how would I go? I just went to, I just drove to Des Moines, Iowa, and back <laughs> and to a climate uh, to a climate thing with uh, issue with Marinette Miller Meeks yeah. and a climate symposium, renewable uh, symposium. Sure. And the one thing I never had to think about when I got my car was where would I get gasoline? I just knew it would be there somewhere when I needed it. And and we don't have that infrastructure for EVs. But if you had plugged in hybrids, think about it. everybody driving around a town would be electric. But then when they have to drive somewhere like Des Moines, they would be able to get gas. But the left doesn't want the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. So even though it would, people would adapt it and buy it and it would reduce carbon in the atmosphere, that's not good enough for them. And therefore we have, I just I have two battery plants being built by Ford in my district and only one's going to be completed. And uh, it's really, um, it, because of what decisions made in the Inflation Reduction Act that has completely distorted investment and is not going to get anywhere near the results that the left wanted. Because it's not, the the world doesn't work like they think it's supposed to work. Yeah, we, we did, we've done a report that you may have seen called Free Economies or Clean Economies. We we mm -hmm. use the, the Heritage Index of Economic Freedom that looks defines economic freedom as things like low taxes, less regulation, less spending. Mm -hmm. And then we compared that with the Yale Environmental Performance Index and found a correlation that the countries that are economically free are twice as clean as those that aren't. And as we saw at the end of the Cold War, the line of demarcation between the East and West, it wasn't just the Berlin Wall, it was literally a line of soot between exactly. East and West Berlin, because the East was dirty, inefficient, corrupt, and the West was much cleaner and more efficient. And exactly. that's the story that I, that I applaud you and the caucus for telling uh, kind of in the next generation. Exactly. So on 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 Russia, you, you mentioned you so you 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 work serve on the NATO committee. I think I think you said, and right. you describe it's important I think for people to connect the dots about how how did energy how did bad energy policy on the left, uh, like you, you didn't overstate the case. You didn't say it caused Putin to go and yeah. you. But what are what are some of the the decisions that happened? So so listeners can can understand those those decision points and how they. Increased national security risk, and I would I would argue, you know, you know, nuclear war is not good for the planet. I think everybody knows exactly. That. When you when you increase global conflict, global global conflict is horrifically bad for the environment. Well, so, I think it's John McCain who said that Russia is a gas station po with an army posing as a country, and, and so that I I'll go to that. But let me go back just so even a step further. When I was a kid, I was a kid of the seventies, and I actually remember gas lines. And I wasn't old enough to drive during gas lines, but my dad would drive the car, get in line, we'd push the car for an hour or so till we got right up to the pump and then run back and get him and say, come pump your gas and drive the Pinto home that we had. I mean, I worked for Ford, so we had Pinto. Uh, and, and so that's the world that I kind of remember. And I was moving my daughter into college. I was in Evanston, Illinois, in the dorm. My wife's at the Target with my child. And this is 2018, I believe it was, when Saudi Arabia was attacked, uh, had, a, had a refinery attacked by Iran. And I remember seeing that and calling my wife immediately and said, fill the car up because we could get home from Evanston to Bowling Green if right. literally the gas is about to run out of the gas tank. And I said, fill it up until it clicks a couple of times because I want to make sure we can get home. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. The price of gas went up a dime mm -hmm. and it dawned on me energy independence. Right. President Trump had the guts to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Why did other presidents said they were some probably just didn't have the courage to do it? But another reason was you had to worry about the reaction of the Arab world if you did that. Once we were energy independent, you didn't have to worry about that anymore. And right. so I do believe we have moral discussions about how we interact in the world in terms of helping friends and allies. But in terms of national security and economic security, we were being energy independent means that doesn't have a you don't have to factor that in. So it really relieves you in that way. So how did it tie in with, with Europe? You know, President Biden, a lot of people give President Trump business on uh, on, on the fact that they keep talking about with Putin. You know, he sent the Javelin missiles to Ukraine, but let's get back to energy policy. He sanctioned the Nord Stream too. 
He said he sanctioned it. President Biden relieved the sanctions on Nord Stream 2. And then President Biden also put in where it's almost it's difficult to export. Now he wants to ban export of LNG, but he also put it where you can drill for oil. And and so a drill for oil and gas. So the problem is the price of gas is high because of the decisions we made. He unleashed the uh, the restrictions on Nord Stream 2. Now, China, because of the gas of price is high, China buys from Russia at an extreme profit to Putin. And that's what funds his army. Mm-hmm. So by not flooding the market with gas, the price is high. Putin gets the uh, profit, which funds his army. So we're sending money to Ukraine, which I, I supported. But we're sending money to Ukraine to fight an army that's being funded because we're not producing gas. Right. And, right. and if that's we would flood the market with gas, he wouldn't have the money. to. He does not like he has other resources. He's he's it, it's the Russian economy is based on oil and gas and, and fossil fuels and, and our decisions. And then you just look at Europeans in general. You know, the price of, of gas is three times higher price of energy, three times higher in Germany than it is here. I mean, how do you compete with that? The point where they're opening up coal, coal plants. Because right, of the right. decisions that they made, and it, you know, you can't make people go backwards. People don't want to go backwards as a society. And the thing is, they don't have to to have a cleaner world. You can innovate and in technology your way forward. Yeah, well, and I want I want to kind of move into that conversation before we run out of time too, because you, the case of Germany is important because it illustrates what happens when you when you have kind of a green new deal style of energy policy that that discourages the local supply. They they turned off a lot of their coal plants and they tried to co- go green and do wind and solar, but then they were just outsourcing outsourcing their emissions to Russia. But exactly. another decision Germany made is they were turning off their nuclear plants. So so you've been you've been a leader in in making sure that we are energy independent with an all of the above strategy. Mm-hmm. You know, not just fossil fuels, but but in, anything that's going to increase supply uh, is is going to be good for for the for the American people and the cause of freedom. Uh, so, so describe kind of the state of play of of, of nuclear energy, and um, and and you you had a bill called the Nuclear for Brownfield Site Preparation Act right. that was a part of the Advance Act. Yeah, uh, so describe so, your, your kind of motivation there and work there. Well, motivation there. So if you're going to have base load power that's carbon free, uh, and I and I'm for all the above. I'm not for all base load has to be carbon free. But if you're gonna if you're gonna move that direction, if you're you know a liberal Democrat and that's where you're going, you can't do it without in current technology. You can't do it without nuclear power. There's hydro. Uh, there's also nuclear, and those are the only wind and solar doesn't offer base load energy. It's not it's intermittent. It's not affordable. It's not sustainable. It's part of the mix. I'm not saying it's not part of the mix, but it doesn't work. But a, but nuclear energy does. And so my area, I have Paradise, which is Muhlenberg County. So if you, I see your guitars in the background, John Prine sang about his father's from Paradise. So take me back to Muhlenberg County. And Paradise had a coal plant that was shut down by Tennessee Valley Authority. They have a combined cycle natural gas plant there now, but they have a coal plant. So the thing is they have all of, so we have to scale up our nuclear is my view. And they have all the ingredients for a successful energy group there. So and there are other sites around the country like this, but Paradise is the one I know. They have all the generation uh, trans- transfer, the lines, they have the energy workforce. And so as we look to scale up nuclear, which we're going to have to do, let's look at sites, energy sites that are brownfields, government inflicted, but are brownfields because uh, they would be e- they would be easier to scale up. And so that speeds up the permitting process because one of the problems is even if you come up with some innovative technology is going to reduce carbon, you can't get it permitted. If mm-hmm. somebody in the, in the Biden Harris administration decides this is not the one that they like, it may be the one that works, but it may not like plugged in hybrids, but it may be the one that really works. But if it's not one that they like, then they can just not permit it. So we're trying to speed up the permitting process for nuclear and I just want to say, people like, I like to talk about how is this safe and secure. We have Three Mile Island. That's when I was a kid. Uh, Chernobyl, which it gets back to the east where it's dirty uh, yeah. energy. They don't follow the same regulatory. So I'm not trying to undermine any, in any way the regulatory infrastructure for nuclear. Just how do we make sure it's safe and secure and we can speed up the process? And is it safe, especially small modular nuclear? Somebody pointed this out to me. I wish I had thought of it. He goes, when you we put a lot of a bunch of men and women who are 18 to 25 years old 
in submarines and put them underwater and send them around the world in our uniform, and it's all modular nuclear. Right. And we don't have problems with submarines leaking and hopefully mm-hmm. not leaking inside. I'm, I'm an Army guy, not a Navy guy. I'm using the right term. But we don't, have, we don't have issues with the nuclear power subs, so we wouldn't have issues with nuclear power on land either. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. So as you as you look ahead to 2025, I mean, it, you know, the challenge is I work I worked for a member for a long time as a comms director. You can't control what happens at the presidential race as much right. as how members will want to, you know, direct that. It's just all you can do is take responsibility for your own race. And mm-hmm. but as you look ahead, what what are what are maybe the one, two or three things that you really hope to do on the committee on, on kind of the energy climate space in 2025? Uh, regardless of the outcome of the of the presidential race? Well, I think we have to absolutely go back to being energy independent. And President Trump has talked about, because it would be difficult to do with if there's a President Harris, because even though she sort of said she's for some, not a total ban on fracking, I'm not really sure what all, all that means. But I do know that President Trump just talked about being energy independent again. And so it's an all the above energy strategy. What I, The biggest thing that we can do now is permitting reform. We have to be able to move our energy uh, from the source to where, like from gas from Western Pennsylvania to where it needs to go. And so we need to make sure that we have a solid policy on uh, on permitting reform. Because right now, as you know, the environmentalists will stack. They'll make this lawsuit, that one gets resolved, a new lawsuit, and that gets resolved. So even even issues that that lessen carbon in the atmosphere if they don't like it they'll hold it up in court and right. so we need to we need to have permitting reform that that is just absolutely critical we need to make sure that we have development on public lands like we have before in an environmental responsible way but we need to make sure that we're not outsourcing our energy to other places we need to make sure that we export energy the lng uh, the LNG ban that President Trump's trying trying to put in place. I can tell you, I was with in NATO talking to he, high level. Trump's trying to lift the ban. Yeah, Biden Biden put the ban in place, and Trump wants. Yeah, to Biden put the ban in place. We need to lift the ban because I was high level people from NATO from major European countries who were telling our, our delegation that we need that will be critical to Europe if we ban LNG exports because mm-hmm. they said we need the price to come down. That's why. And they said it almost exactly the way I just said it to you in a meeting. And I can't quote who said it, but it's somebody that does speak for the German government. We need the price to come down. And so those are so we get permitting reform, the development and exploration, and and making sure that we have LN, we don't do the LNG export ban, and then support technology. Uh, I was in the Permian Basin. They have these towers they're putting up that take carbon out of the air and bury it into the bury it into the ground. So instead of just saying no nuclear, no, no, excuse me, no fossil fuels, how do we make fossil fuels that are affordable, sustainable, and reliable work in a way that reduces carbon in the atmosphere, as opposed to just going, we're going to go to an unknown technology, wind and solar, that can't support the country. At the same, I, I was just in uh, Microsoft. They say some of their data centers have used the power of major cities. Mm-hmm. And so we're having more demand for energy. Right. Even the Democrats in their EV mandate on vehicles, it's going to require more electricity. Batteries don't create electricity, they store it. So you have right. to create the electricity somewhere. So you're going to put more demand on the grid and with a nonsensical policy to create more energy. And, and the matter of fact, their policies make energy unreliable. Right, right. That's right. Yeah, so it, well, it's going to be fascinating to watch what's going to happen, and uh, and we appreciate you taking the time, and we're going to follow these issues closely. Uh, hope to have you back on next year. And again, this is John Hart with C three Solutions. Uh, you can follow us at, at c3newsmag.com. Thanks for having me. You bet. Thanks, Congressman.